Matthew chapter 1. We look at this, we think about Christmas and everything, and, and as we sing many of the, the, the Christmas songs, the traditional ones and everything, uh, most of them have some pretty good stuff in there. Some of them, you, you know, you got to kind of uh, take with a little bit of a grain of salt as far as their being doctrinally correct and everything and biblically correct and all that. We also see that we as Christians, as believers, being on this side, if you will, of salvation, we see the glory of Christ in these things that the world may not always see. We see the, the cross and we shine it up and do this and all that stuff and, and everything because we see the glory of the cross, but it was an old rugged bloodied cross. And we think of, of the manger, that feed trough that Jesus was put in after he was born and go, you know, the amazing that Christ came and, and dwelt among us. But it was a feed trough in some form of a barn. Tradition doesn't always answer the questions that the text of the scripture brings up as we look at the birth of Christ. One of the songs that we sing is, What Child Is This? What child is this? Mary's little babe, you know, we have our nativity scenes and we do all that stuff. Some of them are right. Some of them we do like we do and put the wise guys in the back because they weren't there yet. You know, if you look around, you see in your neighbor's yard and everything, some of them have the nativity scenes and there's all kinds of stuff there. If you watch the things that you see on television, often even the Christian things, you can get some wrong ideas. I saw one one time where it was an animated thing, even had a talking donkey. There is a talking donkey in the Bible, but he was a long way from here. <laughs> you know, you see the, the, the things that are all lit up there, and you look at the, at the things, you see a nativity scene, and it's got reindeers and Santa Claus, and you think Jesus was born at the North Pole. A lot of things that aren't right, but hidden in the tradition are the seeds of truth. And those are the things that we as believers, as Christians, need to look to and remember. Those are the things that we celebrate and rejoice. And those are the things that we ought to share with those around us at this time. There's great controversy out there in, in, in whether you could say Merry Christmas anymore. I hope we all do. I hope we all say Merry Christmas when somebody says Happy Holidays. Amen. Interesting thing that, that somebody mentioned a while back about holidays that kind of made me go, yeah. As they say Happy Holidays, they're saying Happy Holy Days. They sit apart, you know, and maybe with different religions and everything, but they're still at least in some way going to that holiness. It all comes back to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 1, we have the short version of the birth of Christ. We'll look at that today. In verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to, your, to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And these things we see that, that, that we as we look at our text, as we, as we look at the scriptures and study the text, and one of the things that I, I teach in a class that I do every now and then about how to study the Bible is ask five questions. You learned them in school, in grade school. Who, what, when, where, and why? You know, as we look at these things, we look at, at what? What's going on? Um, let me finish reading this passage here. He's, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did, the, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now we know that the other Gospels add more detail to this, and so what is going on here? What's happening? Mary, this virgin who is going to bring forth the, the son, the one promised in, in, in prophecy in Isaiah, behold, a child will be given to you, born of a virgin. She's fulfilling this prophecy. That whole sitting and that whole circumstance, as, as we know, would be a very difficult one. Mary, after the angel came and told her, and she was uh, with child of the Holy Spirit, she went to spend three months up in the hills with her aunt and came back quite pregnant. Joseph's going, what's up, Mary? <laughs> you know, how can this be? And so she tells him this fantastic story of how the prophesied virgin that would bring forth the child, the Messiah, was her. And how the angel spoke to her and that the child was the Holy Spirit. She probably told of how John the Baptist, the babe in her aunt, leaped as, G as she came up with Jesus. These things. And Joseph... We see his first response here was, okay. He wanted to quietly put her away and just call off the wedding and all that stuff and everything because here she was with child and they weren't married yet. Not the situation that most people want to find themselves in. This young woman, this young girl. It would have brought shame on her and her family. And the story that she told would have been very difficult to believe. And the angel came and, and told Joseph to go ahead and take her as your wife because that which is, that she's pregnant with is of the Holy Spirit, confirming that this was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so Mary takes her, and about this time, about the time for the, the, the baby to be born, a census is called for by the Roman government. We all like that, don't we? This oppressive government that came in and, and ruled over the, the Jews and Israel and all that. And Roman government was pretty strict, pretty tight. You know, Romans had this thing called Pax Romano, Roman peace, which meant if you were our army, we did, are your enemy, you either changed your mind and agreed with us or they did you in. Best way to get rid of an enemy is to get rid of an enemy. It's the way they thought. They sent out this thing that everybody should go back to their hometown, the place of their birth, where their family was from. Not the best time to travel, is it, ladies who have children, right before you give birth. Hey, let's take a trip. You know? And they didn't hop in a comfy car or anything like that and go to, to Bethlehem. Most of, of the tradition and everything we see, Mary's riding in on a donkey, that would be rough. Anybody ever ride a donkey? Those things are not smooth. Yeah, they don't have shock absorbers, do they? They're rough. That would have been hard enough, but more than likely they walked with family, with other people and everything as they traveled back from to Bethlehem, or back to Bethlehem, the place where they were there. The census was there. How many of you would like to have to go back to your hometown just so you could be counted so that the government could charge you more taxes? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, no one, nobody want to do that. They go back there, they come into this place, this crowded town with all the people that were around, and they're relatives of Joseph, and yet they find no place to stay. They go to the inn, no room there. What about the family members? How many of you go back to visit family and they say, well, you know, good luck finding a place to stay. And this unwed couple and her about to deliver this child. 
and the way that would look may have, we don't know, prevented family from taking them in. But whatever the case, they didn't find this place, and the, the only place they could find was a barn. It may have been some makeshift stable or anything for, for the different people in town or anything, but it was a barn where there was a feed trough. The animals and stuff like that, probably not the tonky, talking donkey, maybe some donkeys, you know, whatever. These things were here. Not the place where you go to have a baby. My mom used to ask me if I was born in a barn, but that was because I was always leaving the door open. <laughs> I said, I don't know, Mom. I don't remember. You do. <laughs> you know, you don't come to that time where you start going into labor and all that and say, hey, can you take me out to the barn? <laughs> but this was what they had. This is what was there. Not the ideal birthplace for a king, is it? Not the ideal birthplace for our Lord and our Savior, but this is where he came to. So we understand the sitting and the situation. It goes on to talk about the, the angels who came, and we all know that they didn't sing. It says the angels said, peace on earth and joy and all that. That makes a better song, it makes a better show. You know, it's something to do with the choir that you got when you're doing your nativity, your, your Christmas play and all that thing. You know, we know that they didn't sing. The angel showed up and announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds. And we know that the shepherds were not the most upstanding individuals in the community. There weren't a whole lot of little boys that say, well, you know, when you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a shepherd. It wasn't the thing. I mean, it, 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 families that did this, it wasn't the best thing. And so the, the, his birth is announced to them. The fulfillment of the prophecy of the virgin birth is being fulfilled in a barn. And the people that the angels announce it to are the shepherds. And so these shepherds come and they see and they find out that what the, the angels had said were true and they go into town and they hit the bars and all that stuff telling people, hey man, guess what? There's a lady over there in the barn. She's a virgin and she just had a baby and it's the fulfillment of scripture. And these people that are there in those places wherever they were hanging out that are upset about the, 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 the being there for the senses and the taxation and all that stuff, you can imagine what it was like, a holy night, right? Silent and all that. They were there, and as, as these shepherds told them, their response was, you guys are nuts. And they didn't hear them. And so the birth of Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the long-awaited Messiah, fulfilling the prophecies of old, was done in such a way where nobody, hardly anyone, knew. And it wasn't with all the pomp and circumstance. They didn't come from miles around to gather around that little feed trough where that baby was at. And the night passed. And they did what was required in return. Not quite what we imagine when we think about it, is it? But that's what the scripture tells us. That's what in these questions was going on. When we know that it was at night, we know that it was at her time, the time that she was to conceive and everything. We got all this, the timing's right. But as we look at this in a greater sense, the Bible tells us that in the fullness of time that Jesus came, in the fullness of time, at just the right time, according to God's timing, these things and these prophecies were fulfilled at just the right time. The conditions and things in the world were just right. We think about traveling and everything in the way we do today. And, you know, I, yesterday we drove up to Ash Fork, had to go up through Yarnell and all that because the freeway was messed up. And what an inconvenience that was. Some 300 miles or more, whatever it was that we, we drove and however many hours and everything, wow. 
Well, travel wasn't quite as easy then, but it was easier than it had ever been. And because of, of the Jewish dispersion and the fact that not many of them came back to Jerusalem when they could under Nehemiah and such, there were Jews scattered all over the place, everywhere, all the synagogues, Jews everywhere. And it was a time where travel was made easy, at least for them in that time, with all the Roman roads and whatnot. And in the fullness of time, in, the, in that proper time, when there were the Jews in the synagogues and the God-fearers, as they were called, those who believed in Yahweh and the prophets that were there and ready to hear. And there was an expectation of the Messiah in that time. It seems to be much like we expect the rapture, right? Which you guys know what to do about that, don't you? Okay. Yeah, you haven't been here. Dessert first, in case you get raptured. You know. Anyhow, there's that expectation, and in the time when the work of Christ could be shared, could be spread, 30 some years later, when the disciples go out, it was the fulfillment of time. It was the right time. And all the details and everything of prophecy about this come together in God's timing. It was the fullness of time. Where was it? Bethlehem, the appointed place. Bethlehem, this little place in Ephraim that does... Never mind. I'll stay back here. <laughs> we're, we're not on camera today. They didn't do that, so do what you want to. <laughs> This prophesied place where the Messiah would be born, that even the Magi, those wise guys from the east, knew about, probably coming back to some of the things that Daniel had said. He was born there in Bethlehem in the right place. So all these things come together. You see this? The next question that we have is who? And this may be one of the most important questions in this, isn't it? Who was born? The baby Jesus. And we look at that and we think and we talk about the baby Jesus and he's all cute and cuddly. Come, let us adore him. It's easy to adore a little baby, isn't it? You know, people like him, they hug him and they do all that and smell him. And, yeah. I like babies, they're just, you know. But that's not who was in the manger, is it? Yeah, it was a baby because Jesus was fully man. Took on that form. Who is this? And it tells us right here in Matthew, it says, um, you will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. John in chapter 1, turn there if you like. John in chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him. Emmanuel, this little baby, God with us. The word of God, who is God, became flesh and dwelt among us. In that little manger lay God Almighty, God All-Knowing, God All-Powerful, God Everlasting. Every attribute and, and character of God the Father was there present in Jesus Christ the baby, veiled in flesh, but unchanged. God with us. 
If we remember and we think about this little baby, ah, oh, God Almighty became flesh and dwelt among us, stepped down from the glory that he had with the Father before the foundations of the earth. Jesus Christ, he didn't begin there in the manger. God Almighty, Revelation says, shows Jesus the Alpha. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God eternal, lying in the manger. We see that baby, we see in Isaiah chapter 9. We call his name Emmanuel. The prophecy speaks of this in verse 6, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Talks about his name, and, and the name speaks of his character and who he is. Because the government shall be on his shoulder. And you see that in that thousand years, that millennial reign and rule of Christ, the government of earth and all on his shoulders, it says, and he will be called wonderful. Wonderful, marvelous, miraculous, something that awe inspires awe. We see those little babies and the little babies inspire awe. But this is that which inspires awe. The amazement. He's amazing, amazed at him. His wonderful counselor. How many of you go to a little baby for counsel? You have God Almighty there for us to counsel us. Mighty God. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. There in that manger, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Everlasting Father, God eternal. Jesus didn't begin at the manger. He was there before the foundations of the earth were ever laid and will be there when they are destroyed with fervent heat. And he'll be there when the new heavens and the new earth are created. And for everlasting, God everlasting there in the manger. We think about this and it's it takes us past that little baby to understand that God Almighty became flesh and dwelt among us. And we think about that oftentimes, don't we? He dwelt among us, and we as believers think that, you know, we're children of God, and why wouldn't he want to come? But that's not who he dwelt among. He left that glory of heaven and came to the barn to the shepherds, to those that were disgraced. He came while we were yet sinners. While we were enemies, he came. He left that and came to dwell among us. In that manger lie the promised seed of Genesis chapter 3. Yeah, Satan would bruise his Hill as we look forward to the cross, but in the end there's victory. Jesus rose on the third day, and in doing that, put to shame those defeated death and Satan and crushed his head. The promised seed that we see all throughout Scripture, the prophet that was promised that would be like Moses that came, and the, the prophecy says that, he'll, that God would bring another prophet like Moses and his word would be in his mouth and that they would hear him. This child, this babe that fulfilled these things. The commander of the Lord's army. We remember as Joshua stood there on the plains facing Jericho and he sees the, the man standing there with a sword drawn and approaches him and says, Who are you? Whose side are you on? He says, I am here as the commander of the armies of God. Whose side are you on? We see that commander then, and we see him as commander of the armies of God as we come back at the end of that thousand years 
on them horses to reign and to rule. This is who was born, who lie in the manger, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. Abraham took Isaac up to the mountain and everything ready to sacrifice him there. And when Isaac said, Father, where's the lamb? Abraham said, the Lord shall provide a lamb. And we know the story that, that the angel stopped Abraham from sacrificing him and there was a lamb there caught in, in the bushes and all that. But it looks forward to this, this lamb, this lamb born to be sacrificed. John the Baptist, as he saw Jesus there, he said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of man. Who was born there? Jesus Christ, God Almighty, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the last question is why? Why? We look at John 3.16 and we all know that one because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should have an everlasting life. We know why, because of the love of the Father. We look to that and we're, we're grateful. We rejoice in that. He came for that. He came to fulfill other prophecies. When John the Baptist, being in prison, sent some of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one, the one that was prophesied about? Are you the Messiah or do we look for someone else? Jesus said, tell him what you've seen. The blind see, the lame walk. The gospel is preached to the poor. The dead are raised. And with what he did, he showed that he was the one who fulfilled the prophecy and brought these blessings to men. He came to show that, to declare who the Father was to us. We see in Christ the, the, the mercy and the grace of our Heavenly Father. Jesus always pointed to him. He came to do his will. He says, I have spiritual food, and that is to do the will of my Father. He came to finish it. And as he died, as he gave up his spirit on the cross, he said, it is finished. He came to finish the work of redemption. And Jesus Christ came because Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not some, not most, not them, but all. Each and every one of us has sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that sin separates us from God Almighty. All have sinned. Look at Romans chapter 1. All have sinned and, and are in this place then and now. Verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because all they, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness, to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. 
Amen? Because they knew God, because we know God, because he's revealed himself, he's never hidden himself, but always revealed himself in so many different ways in Christ the Lord, as he, God became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, he revealed himself. Why? Because we were in this sinful state, not glorifying God, not being thankful, not worshiping the true God. God, as we, excuse me, all well know, has been changed in the images of most people's minds to something, someone who is not God. That's why it's so important for us as believers to come back to what the Bible shows us, what the Bible tells us, to where God declares himself to us, so that we know who he is without doubt. We're all in that place, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, says that the wages of sin are death. And we're not speaking about that bodily death because one day each and every one of us will be absent from this body. And if you're a believer, born again, believer, present with the Lord. Hopefully we'll get raptured any second now. Not that death, but that separation from God, that separation from the spiritual life of God, the life that he came to give us. Jesus came to pay the price, to be the lamb, to be the sacrifice for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And because of us, because our loving Father was willing to send his Son, Jesus Christ, because he loved the world so much. And some say, what kind of God, what kind of Father would send his Son to die for someone like us? What kind of Son would love us so much that he said, Father, I will go. Jesus came to do the will of his Father. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. And it's a debt that we could not pay. A righteous, perfect life given for a sinful enemy of God, you and I. That's why he came. That's why that baby was born and laid in that manger. That's why these prophecies were fulfilled, to pay the price for our sin. So God could show us that much. He was born to die. You saw the things that Jesus did in, throughout his ministry and everything that, that proved that he was who he says he was, that he was worthy to be that sacrifice, that lamb slain for us. He came to die. He came so that he could go and be put on trial for proclaiming the truth that he was the Son of God. He came so that he could be beaten and whipped so that he could be nailed and hung on a cross for my sin, for your sin, for all that sin, so he could pay that price that we have no way or hope of ever paying ourselves. That baby was born to die in our place, the sacrificial lamb, because our Father loves us. He paid the price to offer the gift. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. We think about the gifts, we think about the presents and, and giving this and giving that, and often in these times we see the, the charity drives and people are generous and giving and all that, and all those things are great and wonderful, but they don't come close, they don't measure up. 
to the gift that Jesus paid for, that he offers, that he gives us, if we will receive it. And that everlasting life, that we can be born again and be new creatures in Christ and have everlasting life, real life, spiritual life, and we can be alive once more to God and be adopted as his children. We can cry out, Abba, Father, and be his, and know that we are kept safe in his hands and his love forever. This is why that baby was born. This is why God became flesh and dwelt among us. This is why he died on the cross for us, to offer that gift. We look at this and we hear oftentimes in, in, in this time of year, oh, it's better to give than it is to receive. Not this gift. Jesus is the only one who can give this gift of life. And we have to come to him personally and say yes to receive that. To receive that gift of life. It was a precious gift, a costly gift, but no greater gift has ever been offered. Not then, not now, than the love of Christ. God, who dwelt among us, who loved us so much that while we were sinners and enemies, his son, Jesus, that baby, came and was born into the manger, laid in the feeding trough on such an unholy night in those circumstances. Why? To show us the love of our Father, to pay the price, to offer us the gift of everlasting life. Jesus is the reason for the season. You ever heard that? It's important for us as believers to take that a step further and see what the re remember what the reason for Jesus is. The gift of life. He offers it to all. Have you received it? If not, there's one thing to do. Say yes. Thank you, Lord. If you have received it, have you unwrapped it? Do you enjoy the fellowship with Christ? Because it's everlasting life. Not for later on. Not for when you die. It doesn't begin when you leave this body. It begins when you receive it when you're born again and adopted into his family. Jesus is the reason for the season, but let us remember the reason for Jesus because we were lost and hopeless in the darkness of our sin and dead to our Father. And he loved us so much that he became flesh was born in a barn and lay in a manger to go and die on a cross because of our sin so that we could have life in Christ and know his love. Everlasting, unfailing love of Christ. That's the reason. Amen? Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that, that you love us with such a, a mighty love that you were willing to, to send your only begotten son to pay the price for us 